Should Dubai an eGPU for your old Mac in 2020? So what's up guys, Fabria and welcome to Shades of Tech. eGPUs have been around for a few years now but they have become better and better over time thanks to metal support and hardware optimization and acceleration. However, in some cases, software optimization is still lacking by Apple and some cards are not working at full potential. So sometimes with newer Macs, thanks to improved direct communication between GPU, CPU and Thunderbolt controller, an eGPU can be a worse solution like we saw with the new 16-inch MacBook Pro, but it's clear that this isn't the case for older Mac models. This video will be comparing test results with and without eGPU for different user scenarios like gaming and video editing and 3D rendering for different Mac categories of older Macs like MacBook Pro, iMac and Mac Pro. And also we'll try to understand if Thunderbolt port is a bottleneck comparing first, second and third generation as well. We'll be using the AMD Radeon RX 5700 XT GPU with 8 gigs of GDDR6 VRAM. It's a really great GPU with 7 nanometer Navic graphics, HAVC H265 optimization and DisplayPort 1.4 that makes it photoproof enough for 8K display support for around $400. Of course you can choose other cheaper models but in my opinion the 5700 XT is the sweet spot. Of course you want to go AMD to have full compatibility with macOS Catalina out of the box. You can find more in the dedicated Apple page I'll leave the link in the description. I want to start this video telling you that the results you'll see are already pretty amazing but you have to take them with a pinch of salt because we expect further optimization for the 5700 XT on the Mac OS side. In fact, generally on Windows it scores almost two times and in Metal Score this card is supposed to score over 75,000 but it actually scores around 45,000. Besides, Apple recently made available an MPX model for the 2019 Mac Pro called Radeon Pro W5700X that scores in theory the same 75,000 points. I think it's a problem of macOS optimization because we got basically the same card of the Mac Pro with the exception that it has 16 gigs of DDR6 VRAM and our has only 8 but they are really similar but it's safe to say that we'll see further optimization. We'll be pairing it with the Razer Core X Thunderbolt 3 GPU enclosure. It definitely is the best value GPU you can buy for the money. It combines great build quality 650 watt power supply that handles even the more power hungry GPUs like the 5700 XT and it costs under $300. The only downside is that it's a little bit noisy so we upgraded the blower with a super silent Noctua fan for $30. More in this video. And talking about all Mac, we'll be using a 2016 13-inch MacBook Pro with i5 dual-core CPU, 8 gigs of RAM and integrator Iris Pro graphic, a 2013 27-inch iMac with i7 quad-core CPU, 32 gigs of RAM, NVIDIA G4 750M, and the 2013 Mac Pro 12-core CPU, 64 gigs of RAM, and dual AMD Fire Pro D300 GPUs. All those tests will be running on internal NVMe SSD. Well, eGPU to be supported on all the Macs but recently it's only available out of the box with Thunderbolt 3 enabled Macs but if you have a Thunderbolt 1 or 2 you can trick the system into thinking it's a Gen 3 by running a script called Pure Wrangler. I don't want to go too much into detail I'll leave the link in the description but let me know if you want to see a dedicated video about that. It's pretty straightforward but I had only one problem with the 5700 XT because it's Navi graphic so I had to skip the automatic procedure just installed the patch, then restart the Mac and only at this time connect the eGPU otherwise the Mac will turn off immediately. The first big improvement that an eGPU can give us is multiple external display all under one single USB-C cable. 
or Thunderbolt cable. It might not seem that big of a deal if you have already a big 27 inch iMac, but it definitely is important if you're using a MacBook Pro. If you're using a laptop, it's because you need portability, but I imagine coming on, placing your MacBook on your desk and just connecting one cable to turn on three display or an ultra wide while charging the battery you have used during all the day and finish the most graphic intensive part of your work or exporting your latest YouTube video. Will the night be awesome? Well, with an eGPU you can do it and it works very well with MacBooks. And what is even better is that if you have a Thunderbolt 2 Mac, you can run 4K display, but often you are limited to the choppy 30 Hz. With an eGPU, you can flawlessly run multiple external display at 4K 60 or 1440p at 144 Hz according to your monitor and also you can unlock HDR features which are really future proof for both video editing and content consumption. So you can basically drive more pixel, higher refresh rate and better colors. And here's a before and after of HDR enabled on your display. Mac Pro is a little bit different story. In theory, you have a multiple Thunderbolt ports, so why would you need an eGPU? Well, just to begin, it's really great to offload graphic tasks to improve the internal cooling of the machine. For example, I use an internal GPU to drive the display and the eGPU to make all the graphic heavy lifting, getting the Mac Pro cooler, giving each GPU its task that can be done at full load. Now everything is set up, so let's start testing with some general benchmark to see what we're using. First is a Geekbench 5 computer test in both Metal and OpenCL score. Starting with Metal, the internal GPU performed really bad and the 2013 iMac with dedicated GPU performs even worse than the 2016 MacBook without dedicated GPU. The score is between 2 and 3000. The Mac Pro scores a blazing 22000, but you have to consider that we're testing only one of the dual GPUs, so the total should be around 30 to 35000 because it's less than two times the single score. The first question is, are there any big difference between using Thunderbolt 1, 2 or 3? And of course the 5700 XT completely obliterates all the scores, being actually better on the iMac which has Thunderbolt 1 up to 10 gigabit per second, then Thunderbolt 2 and 3 that go up to 20 and 40 gigabit per second are really close. We are in the neighborhood of 45,000. We're talking about 15 times improvement for the MacBook Pro, 18 times for iMac and only two times for the Mac Pro. So from this test, we don't see any bottleneck from Thunderbolt 1. With OpenCL, the number change about the situation is basically the same, with the 57 under XT destroying the other result and getting up to 20 times the iMac score. Again, no apparent Thunderbolt 1 bottleneck. Next up, we wanted to test some gaming. Mac generally are really bad at gaming, like our test will show you. But since you're considering to buy an eGPU, you could game in your free time, right? Well, it's actually true because this eGPU boosts the gaming performance a lot. In this video, we'll try some synthetic benchmark, and in the next video, we'll test Fortnite gaming on those machines with and without eGPU. What do you think? First, we try Unigen Heaven test with extreme setting and all the Mac performed terribly. The Mac Pro here didn't have the advantage of using the dual GPU because gaming only uses one, but reached a score of almost 600 with 24 average FPS. But the other two were even worse, being the MacBook Pro really terrible with 8 FPS average and the iMac with 13.5 FPS. Before we discuss the eGPU results, it's important to talk about eGPU configuration. For gaming to have the best smooth experience with higher FPS, you want to connect your external display directly to the GPU with a DisplayPort cable. This is the best solution, but unfortunately we weren't able to make 
that on the iMac because every time we hooked up the monitor the system just stopped working and we had to reboot. I think this is due to the Thunderbolt 1 bandwidth that is too low to hook up a 4K display and this is definitely a downside because you can't run a high refresh rate external monitors and because you'll get worse experience with the eGPU because the signal has to go from your Mac to the GPU and then back to the Mac and then to the external display. You see we are making some inefficiencies. Thunderbolt 2 and 3 work flawlessly with this configuration with external display directly connected to the eGPU getting almost 70 fps on average at extreme setting and we will be able to go above 100 fps by reducing the quality of course this was very impressive and the Mac Pro actually was the best with over 1800 points and a maximum of 150 fps also the MacBook Pro went above 60 fps getting almost 700% improvement as we said, the iMac had to run on its internal display and scored 45 FPS on average. Playable, but not ideal. So as you can see, gaming on Thunderbolt 1 can be a downside and second and third generation were awesome, no problem at all. Next, we have Unigen Valley at extreme HD setting. Same situation, very bad result with internal graphic. Mac Pro scored 24 FPS, iMac 12 and MacBook Pro 5. But after we reached 67 with the Mac Pro and the 69 with the MacBook Pro. So again, in this case, the iMac wasn't able to go above 40 FPS average. Turns out, of course, that for gaming, the CPU is not that important, neither the RAM, as long as you have a good GPU. And the Thunderbolt 3 has a little bit of advantage over the Thunderbolt 2, being the one definitely limited. Then we tested video editing. Here the configuration can change a little bit because if you have already a decent GPU, you can use it to drive the display and use the external GPU as heavy lifting for rendering and exporting videos. In this way you'll get fast response for editing and raw power for rendering and exporting. But on the MacBook, the internal GPU is unable to handle smoothly a timeline, a 4K timeline, so the best result will be to use an external display directly hooked up to the eGPU. We started with the popular Bruce X test for Final Cut Pro 10. The Mac Pro here was using at full load all the two GPUs, so it was advantage with 28 seconds and the other two were around one and a half minute each. Using the eGPU the situation changed being the iMac with Thunderbolt 1 very fast with 14 seconds really close to the Mac Pro that was the fastest probably because of the better CPU. The MacBook Pro took a good 17 seconds so apparently no different on Thunderbolt port and then some real life tests exporting a 4K 5 minute clip for my channel in H.264 this test designed with LUT white balance, two color correction layers, applied a lot of text, transition and many motion VFX, motion tracking plugins and call out. So this is quite an heavy task. In fact, our poor MacBook Pro took three hours and 10 minutes. It took forever to make this test. The iMac took almost one hour and 20 minutes, again a lot, and the Mac Pro 34 minutes. Since they all have bad GPUs, here the real difference is made by the CPU and the 12 core 24 thread and dual GPU of the Mac Pro blew away all the rest. But since Catalina supports metal hardware acceleration, let's see what our 5700XT did. And spoiler alert, it's mind blowing. The iMac Pro took only 18 minutes, it's like 25 of the time before. The Mac Pro took 17 minutes, like 50% of before and those results are really great result. Well our poor 2016 MacBook Pro with internal Aries Pro graphic completed the exporting in 14 minutes and 11 seconds, almost 3 minutes faster than the full spec Mac Pro with 12 core CPU. This result made me question all my decision basically because a weak dual core machine with 8 gigs of RAM and even without a dedicated GPU that completed alone this task in more than 3 hours, was able 
to smoke out the 12 core CPU 64 gigs of RAM, the combined internal GPU to drive external display and eGPU for exporting. And since I am editing this video on this machine, I can tell you that the experience is flawless on a 4K display and the timeline is smooth and the editing is nice, no proxy at all, better quality. So basically I reach two conclusions. The first, thanks to hardware acceleration for video editing on Final Cut Pro 10, you can have even a 28 core CPU, but the truth is that you just need a good GPU to make all the work. And second, that this is proof that for this task, Thunderbolt 2 on the Mac Pro has to create, of course, some bottleneck. This timeline is created to have at the beginning and at the end a big portion of callouts and text and transitions all together that need both GPU and CPU working together. So I think that since the data has to go back and forth from Mac to the eGPU on the 40 gigabit per second Thunderbolt 3, there is a big advantage. In fact, the main advantage of the MacBook Pro was in those parts, the rest was very similar. In this way, you can explain that three minutes less. To be honest, we tested also Blender, but since it's basically CPU intensive, the MacBook Pro and the iMac couldn't complete in less than five hours. So we were not able to test them and we were able to test only the Mac Pro and we saw an improvement of around 50 minutes. So I think it's quite good. So in conclusion, should you buy an eGPU for your old Mac in 2020? Well, yes, if your Mac has at least a Thunderbolt 2 port, but for video editing it's better to have a Thunderbolt 3. For gaming, Thunderbolt 2 is enough since there is no real advantage. $600 to export an heavy video in 14 minutes is the best value upgrade you can make as a video editor and with $600 you can't buy anything on the Mac side that can handle 4K timeline this well. This blows out any other new Mac. For Mac with those capabilities you need to get at least a 27 inch iMac 2019 with a Vega 48 and we are talking about around $3000. So if you already have a Mac this is your best value option for only $600. If you are a gamer as you saw and you have a Mac you have seen you can play smooth 60 to 70 fps with extreme setting on external 4k display but don't worry in the next video we'll be testing some real life fortnite on the same machine and also we'll be pushing video editing on the mac pro only even farther with 8k footage and on the macbook pro as well because it was the best one so that's it i really hope you found this video helpful thanks so much for watching me so far be sure to like or dislike this video, comment and subscribe. And as always, stay tuned on Shades of Tech. Ciao!